Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. On Tuesday, Israel carried out a joint missile strike with the United States in the Mediterranean Sea. Now joining us to discuss all this is Sheer Hever. Sheer is an economist studying the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories for the Alternative Information Center, a joint Palestinian-Israeli organization dedicated to publishing alternative information and analysis. Thanks for joining us, Sheer. Thank you, Jessica, for having me. So, Shir, what was your reaction to the strike? And can you just elaborate for our viewers, what are the intentions of the Israeli government as you see them? This strike uh, was actually of a missile that is uh, supposed to imitate the kind of uh, rockets or missiles that uh, could conceivably be uh, fired from Syria against Israel in case of a war or against uh, other targets. Um, the way that this is covered in the news at the uh, uh, right now is that uh, both the Israeli military and the uh, U.S. military have somehow believed that they could uh, just do a normal routine sort of test uh, uh, using those uh, this missile in order to to study its trajectory and so on, uh, and that uh, the launch will not be detected and or, and will not uh, contribute to the tension in the area, uh, especially considering the speculations about a, um, an attack by the United States against Syria in the, in the um, uh, near future. Um, I think uh, uh, there is a possibility that both military commands have simply got it wrong and had no idea that what they're uh, that this um, um, test or, or, or exercise uh, will draw so much attention. But I think uh, there's also uh, uh, some uh, merit to the speculation that uh, the Israeli army is currently uh, very frantically trying to create evidence uh, that it needs uh, to prepare and it needs more budgets in order to uh, um, prepare itself for a, a face-off against uh, Syria. Um, so what are the interests of the Israeli government? The Israeli government uh, does actually, uh, the most rational approach uh, is to stay out of uh, the situation in, in Syria, the, the civil war. Uh, the Israeli government has um, uh, knows that any kind of Israeli involvement would, uh, in the in the long run, be uh, in, against the interests of Israel, and could put uh, Israeli uh, uh, civilians and soldiers at risk. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the Israeli government tends to be drawn into these conflicts because of a lot of uh, political interests. And uh, what we see now is that um, uh, Netanyahu and his uh, loyal ministers are trying to juggle several uh, balls at once. They're trying to uh, get the public to support their continued policies, which emphasize security uh, at the expense of social projects and spo social spending. And at the same time, uh, they're trying to... Uh, Avoid uh, getting the uh, creating the impression that they're heading toward a complete disaster and trying to drive the country off a cliff by um, starting wars that they're not able to finish. Uh, now, I think from the point of view of Netanyahu, uh, he's actually already achieved his goal because Netanyahu um, was. Uh, I don't think he wants war between Israel and Syria. Maybe he won't. He doesn't mind so much um, to, uh, that, that U.S. soldiers will, will bloody themselves and bloody uh, uh, Syrian civilians, and uh, that that doesn't necessarily uh, worry him so much. But uh, it certainly wouldn't be very good for him if uh, Israel will, will enter uh, an armed conflict in which uh, it cannot achieve its strategic goals. But at the same time, there's a lot of pressure inside Israel to try to improve the social situation, to try to reduce social inequalities and to increase public spending. Uh, Israel is the highest spender in the world on military and security. Uh, in, in terms of a proportion of its GDP. So there has been a, a campaign for years to try to reduce the defense budget. Uh, and uh, But because Israel's defense budget is so large, it's uh, it has created around itself a whole community of the Israeli elite, uh, of, of generals and officers uh, and people in the arms industry, which is, this is their livelihood, this is their source of income, and a, a cut to the Israeli defense budget uh, is something that they're very much concerned about. 
And uh, in this sort of po- internal political struggle in Israel, it has finally been achieved with a new government, which has uh, just recently come into power, uh, to reduce the defense budget by $1 billion. That's a, a marginal reduction, actually. It's a, it's a small amount compared to the to the um, total size of the defense budget, which, which is over $20 billion. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it was a certain precedent that it is possible to, to uh, cut the defense budget and, and use that money for other purposes. With the current uh, uh, crisis in Syria, the current civil war, and the uh, chance that it will also affect Israel, the government has been able to undo all of this political process that has taken years and cancel the the reduction of the defense budget. That means this billion dollars will go back into the defense budget and will be cut from education programs, from health program, programs. And uh, in order to justify this, it's very important uh, to get the Israeli public into a state of fear. Okay, let's talk a little bit about that fear. There was a recent poll that came out. Um, The latest figures coming out say that about 40 percent of Arab Israelis are saying that they see the Assad regime retaliating against Israel if the United States does decide to strike Israel, and a number reaching up to 46 percent for Jewish Israelis. What do you make of that poll? Well, it shows uh, uh, that possibly uh, Netanyahu has been successful in, in getting the people, uh, the public into a state of panic. Uh, uh, every 10 years or so, there is a, a, a threat of a chemical attack against Israel. Uh, and this has started with the, war, uh, the Gulf War of 1991, in which uh, all Israeli citizens were issued um, gas masks in order to protect themselves from a possible chemical attack. No chemical attack is actually... Can, uh, come. Uh, uh, two people have died uh, because of, of anxiety, because they were expecting a chemical attack. Uh, but uh, the massive industrial project of uh, outfitting the entire population with these uh, masks uh, to protect them from a possible chemical attack has become an aspect of the Israeli military industrial complex. The thing about these masks and these, it's not just a mask, it's also a kit that contains uh, toxins, very dangerous toxins actually, Uh, but in the case of nerve gas attacks, these toxins are supposed to act as a counter agent. Um, And the thing about these uh, kits is that they have a short lifespan. And in 2003, when the United States invaded Iraq again, uh, the um, kits that were issued in 1991, most of them were no longer uh, valid, no longer uh, uh, workable. So once again, the state had to very quickly, uh, uh, frantically organize the production and distribution of another set of kits to the population. These things cost a lot of money, and there are companies that make a very good profit uh, from that. And now we see 10 years ag- uh, later, when the kits that were issued in 2003 no longer uh, relevant, uh, no longer uh, usable, that uh, uh, there is a lot of talk in the Israeli media uh, about whether there are enough uh, kits, uh, whether it should they should be distributed again uh, and produced in mass again. And I think that's why uh, the issue of a chemical attack was so important to the Israeli government. This is something uh, that, um, uh, I mean, we, we've seen up to now, up, up to 100,000 people in Syria that were killed in the uh, civil war. But uh, the uh, but Netanyahu has actually put a lot of pressure on Obama to say that chemical weapons would be a red line. This is the language that Netanyahu used. Later, Obama accepted this language word for word and said chemical weapons is the red line. And now this is uh, uh, the continuation of the story where we see how uh, the United States is now getting ready to attack because this red line has been crossed, uh, as if the lives of people who were killed by other means are not as valuable. Uh, and but, but of course, the, the importance of the chemical weapons is that it, produ- it, it caters to a very specific aspect of the Israeli military industrial complex that produces the kits. But in order to get people to be convinced yet again to outfit themselves with these uh, uh, kits uh, to protect themselves from a chemical attack, it, it's very important to create an atmosphere of fear. Israelis who have any kind of memory... Uh, well, I, I have this memory because I've lived in Israel during these uh, last two wars uh, and, they, and and lived through this craze of, of everyone has to have their kits with them at all times, 
children would take these kids with them to school and so on, um, is uh, uh, something that, that the public has to envision uh, that a chemical attack might be coming any moment. Uh, this is something that actually has a lot of uh, very negative side effects, uh, psychological side effects, because uh, uh, the, the people become really afraid, uh, even though there is actually no evidence that uh, chemical weapons would be pointed at Israel at all. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, for Netanyahu, this kind of fear is uh, what would justify increasing the defense budget, which is something that's very important for his coalition and for his uh, allies within the top uh, military brass, uh, getting a lot of contracts for uh, the Israeli weapon companies, especially those companies that are producing those kits, and uh, also uh, distracting from the whole issue of uh, the... Uh, social conditions in Israel, which are in a state of, of collapse and, uh, and, and crisis and, and very high inequality, and the, the predictable and obvious failure of the Israeli government to make any headway in the uh, peace negotiations with the Palestinians, uh, because now uh, peace uh, talks have uh, resumed again. But I think everybody knows that Israel is not willing to make any offers that it didn't offer before, meaning that there's no chance uh, to uh, end occupation and no chance uh, to resolve the, the reasons for the conflict and the repression of Palestinians based on these talks. But in order to um, convince the public that Netanyahu is not completely incompetent, uh, he needs uh, people to believe that they need a strong leader who's more concerned about security issues. And that's why uh, the instability in Syria has already served its purpose for Netanyahu. Well, really important points there, Sheer. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.